the need is real for us to be the advocates that God has called us to be. We were continuing in our series called More, more Than Mediocre, and today what I want to focus on is being more than mediocre when it comes to our advocacy. God has called us to be the advocates in, and to be uh, prophetic in the ministry that he has called us to in this life. Every one of us has been called to, to be a prophetic voice in our culture. In the book of Luke, If you have your Bibles, the book of Luke, chapter 4. Jesus begins out his ministry. As you guys know, Luke chapter 4, Jesus makes a declaration. It's actually the declaration of the church. It's the declaration of his ministry. And he's proclaiming who he is. And he uses some verses out of Isaiah. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to be to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him, and they marveled at his gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth. And then they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever you have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, that no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and they thrust him out of the city and they led him out to the brow of a hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. (laughs) I was reading these verses of Scripture the other day and just just contemplating what God would have me to share with you as we're we're being challenged to to step up, to to be more than mediocre, not not just to accept a halfway life, not just to accept doing things to get by, uh, I know that the challenge has been that we that we move beyond just saying, "Well, this is okay, and I'm doing enough to get by," or "or I'm doing enough to 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 live a, a somewhat fulfilled life." And, and I've been challenging us to be more than mediocre, to live the, the the full purpose that God has for each one of us. And in these verses of Scripture, I'm reminded that Jesus. Even when he started out his ministry, he had already laid out the mandate of the Great Commission, which was what? To preach the good news and to restore people or to bring people uh, into a relationship with Jesus Christ through the actions, to be proactive. And and that's really the the meat of all of the gospel is that we uh, be prophetic and be proactive that we speak truth and that we do it with our intentions, with our wills, with our hands, with our action as well. And so as, as, as I look at these verses of Scripture, I'm reminded that Jesus was confronted by a culture very much like our culture, one in which they, in, in which they uh, questioned his prophetic nature. And, and today... Uh, I want to tell you, to be prophetic is not to be crazy. To be prophetic is not to be abrasive. To be prophetic is not to be lies off air. To be prophetic is to speak truth 
in the midst of culture. And sometimes that does become a little abrasive, but it should not be spoken with an abrasive tone. It should never be, it should never be our intention to be abrasive or to be crazy, to be viewed as crazy. It, it should always be our intentions to always speak truth. God's truth. And so he said, the spirit of the the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach this gospel to those who are in need. So we are called then in the mandate for each one of us in this life, in in this culture, is to speak truth. Now we understand in light of everything that's taken place over the last couple of weeks, and if you've not heard what's taking place in Charlottesville as well as uh, other parts of the nation, you, you got your head in the sand. Uh, I mean, I even, I had turned off all news outlets. <laughs> we haven't watched the news, we haven't, and yet this stuff is coming in through every means. The, the, this push uh, to try to push people uh, into one side or one camp. Uh, to try to distinguish us in a political sense uh, of where we stand uh, when it comes to issues of race and when we come to issues of bigotry. And I want to tell you, there is no place in the church for bigotry. There is no, there is no place in the church for us to make racist comments or, or, to, or to be in any way uh, think that we're superior uh, one over another. God is called and he has, he has called us to be equal. Second Corinthians reminds us this. This is what it says in Second Corinthians. All right, Second Corinthians 8, starting in verse 13. It says, Our desire is not that others might be, believe, be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much and the one who gathered little did not have too little. And so the, the goal of the gospel then, the goal of our, of our advocacy when we're preaching the good news is not to make, to make ourselves greater than one another, but is to say, hey, this is, the, this is a level playing field. We invite God's presence to be here, that God has called us then to be the ones that would, that would allow there to be some semblance of reasoning, uh, some semblance of his presence in, in the midst of discussions, in the midst of culture that is many times unreasonable. Can I tell you, you're not going to reason with anyone on social media. I, I'm, I'm just going to put this out there because some of us, we want to get defensive on social media. And the reality is all that you're going to do is create one camp or another. You can't do that on social media. It is not a platform that equals uh, any kind of reasonability. The only, pl- the only place that you can do that is when you actually engage in relationship with people. And God has called us to be a relational church. God has called us to be a relational people. Eat with me, pray with me, intercede with me, get to know me, talk with me, get to know them, talk with them, pray with them, intercede with them, see what's going on in their lives. And when you start engaging a culture in that way, can I tell you, you will see, you will be able, you will be given an opportunity to speak prophetically into that situation and into that circumstance. But it requires something on our part. It requires us many times to keep our mouths shut when it comes to our opinions and to keep our ears open. That we ought to listen twice as much as we speak. And that when we do speak, that we're making sure that we're doing it prophetically. In other words, that it's God speaking through us, that it is, it is his words that are coming out of our mouths, that it is his words that are, that are permeating the, the, the very nature and the soul of the people that we are, that we're including in that conversation. For God want, desires us to speak to that culture. So he says, I have been anointed to preach this gospel to the poor, to the ones who are in need of healing, to the ones who are brokenhearted. And then he says this, he, listen what he says. He says, I, I came to proclaim liberty to 
the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So there, there's an there's an action there as well. That in as much as we're called to be prophetic, we're also called to get involved. I, I, I love the story of a of a of a mother who shares about her daughter who was born with Down syndrome. And you guys know that's always close to my heart when I hear stories like this. Her daughter was born with Down syndrome, and uh, and and she wanted her daughter to have the same educational access that uh, her other children did. And so she lobbied and she advocated uh, that her daughter would be uh, included in many of these activities. And when her daughter got to high school, her daughter was voted the prom queen and and embraced by the entire school. The entire school loved her. And then on her graduation day, she was escorted in a police escort. It got to turn on the lights on the uh, on the police car. It made her entire high school year just the just the, the most incredible thing. All she raved about was how how important uh, people allowed her to feel. It was that advocacy of the of that parent that allowed that that child to experience a fullness in her upbringing. And I want to tell you that what, what are we doing as a community? She said that what really impressed her about this whole thing was how the community rallied around her daughter. Now, what are we doing as a community to rally around those who are voiceless, to rally around those who are hurting, to rally around those who are in need today? We're to call to engage in a culture that would be able to proclaim liberty, to say, hey, you are free to be the person that God has called you to be. Now, you've heard uh, Sister Donna talk about the, the, these young ladies who are being bought and sold. On uh, Sometimes it feels like it's on an open market. It, it, it's like they're a commodity. And what are we doing as a, as a culture? What are we doing as a church to address this particular area? How are we advocating for those who are bound and oppressed? What are we willing to do? What are we willing to do for those who are in a socioeconomic status that does not allow them to, to uh, embrace a better life? I got an email just this uh, Tuesday. Uh, as you guys know, we've been actively involved in the schools, and I sit on the faith advisory committee at the, at, in the St. John's County school system, and, and they sent me a, an email. They said, we know you're so involved in so many things, but... Uh, we just want to present one need, and we know that you've partnered with St. John's Technical School. There's kids in St. John's Technical School that go home every day and have nothing to eat. I so said, we've, we've already arranged to have all the food, uh, all these things. Uh, that we've arranged what we need is them to be packed together in bags and to uh to just be brought once a month if you can just drop off these 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 blessings in a backpack is what they call would you be willing to do that now i'm not answering yet because i'm going to ask you and challenge you are you willing to help us stuff a few bags and get blessings in a backpack so that our kids when they leave school they only have two meals a day they have nothing at home waiting for them, that they can have something that they can take home every week that would provide them nourishment in the evening. Would you be willing to do that? I'm putting you on the spot, am I? Ain't I? It, it would require us some concerted effort on our part to maybe gather once a week or, or, or once a month or, or one, twice a month where we can pack these bags and put them together and then, and then drop them off to uh, St. John's Technical School. But if we're, if you are, how practical of our faith can we, how practical can we make our faith when it comes to reaching out and advocating for those in our community who are in need? Psalms chapter 41 verse 1, one says this, it says, Blessed is he who has regard for the weak, for the Lord delivers him in the times of his trouble. He says, if you think about those who, who are in trouble now, when you're there, the Lord already has seen what you've done and he regards you. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I know, I know where you're going through right now. 
and I'll take care of you. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 8 and 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. See, God has called us to be advocates in a culture. I know that, I know that, that kind of slaps against what some of us have grown up where, where, where we say, well, that's a social gospel, pastor. You know, we shouldn't be preaching a social gospel. I agree. I think we need to be careful how social our gospel becomes. I, I agree with that. I agree that we can be so social in our gospel that we miss out on being the prophetic voice. I'm not talking about to move to this side where we lose our prophetic voice. I'm saying that we need to be a prophetic voice that does what God has called us to do. That we step up to the plate and be the prophetic voice in our community that is needed so that then we can, by the actions, show the love of Christ to a community and present them with the gospel. I'm challenged in my own heart and in my own life. What are we doing? What am I doing? What is this church doing to be an advocate in its community? We have so many needs. And and listen, I'm not saying that we need to pick up every need. There's so many needs in our community. But what part can we play? What things can we do? Where are our hearts centered and focused? Is it on our own desires or on our own wants and our own religious experience or is it on the heart of God to be prophetic and proactive in everything that we set our hands to do? Listen, I don't want to settle for mediocre. I don't want to settle for halfway. I don't want to settle for just getting by. My desire is that you as, as well as I join this journey up this mountain Mediocre. Remember, we talked the entomology of the word. Mediocris. Halfway up the mountain. I don't want to stop halfway on the journey. I don't want to settle for halfway. I don't want to settle for, good job, faithful servant. I want to hear his words to me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not, "Eh, you were good. That was okay. Well done, good and faithful servant. That on the day that we are confronted with Christ, when we see him face to face, that he can look at us and really, and really extol the Father and say, well done, well done. So Jesus brings out two points. As he, as he, he already knows what the naysayers are going to say. They're going to say, hey, you, you should ju- you, you're just a prophetic voice. And there's no practical application here. Uh, well, if you want to real, be real practical about it, then, then we need to take care of our own first. Ooh. That's really what he was saying. Did, did, you, did you read the verses? He, he was saying, yeah, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, physician, heal yourself. You need to take care of your own first. Come here. Do what you did back there. Do it over here. Yeah, uh, we don't. We don't. We we think you. What you're saying is 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 fairly prophetic. You know, good words. They they applauded him, but then they said, "Isn't he the son of Joseph? This guy. I mean, come on. He's just a neighborhood kid. He doesn't. What what does he have to offer?" And he says, "I know what. I know what you're saying. You're saying, come on, let's take care of our own first. So then he he presents them with this challenge. He goes. Don't you know that a prophet is without honor in his own hometown? And then what does he do? He, point, he gives two stories. Two stories. One of Elijah. Elijah goes into the land of Sidon. You remember where the land of Sidon is? It's on the, cor- it's on the coast. It's actually on the Syrophoenician coast. So it was part of Syria, but also part of uh, the Israelite nation. So the, there, there was a lot of uh, uh, folks who had settled there that had been there for many, many years. And, and this woman was actually a Syrophoenician woman. Uh, you know what Syrophoenician are? The, the Phoenicians were the ones who were the navigated the, the, the Mediterranean. They were the first, uh, one of the first explorers. And, and the Syrians were one of the most tribally uh, aggressive uh, nations that had actually fallen, and uh, they were there in that uh, in the land of Canaan, and uh, they were not allowed to mingle with the Jews, or the Jews were not allowed to mingle with them. So, out of all the widows that were in 
and all of Israel. God sends them just over the border to a Gentile woman. She was Syrophoenician. She was the enemy of the Israelites. And he, and he sends Elijah over there, and Elijah stays in her house. She provides for him, and he ministers to her. And so this is the, actually, Elijah is considered the very first prophet to the Gentiles. And so Jesus, he, he's, he's bringing this up to them because he knows that they hate this. Because their definition of who is your neighbor, and we're going we're gonna to start a series in two weeks. Um, the series is called My Neighbor. And we're going to talk a little bit about being neighbors. Who is your neighbor? And, and, and in this culture, they were not considered neighbors. The neighbor was only another Jew. And your neighbor was only one. Some, some people only considered their, their neighbors to be the person next to them and the person up to two doors down. And everyone else was just, they weren't their neighbors. So they didn't have to worry about them. And Jesus kind of flips this on top of them. So he, he says, he went out to the Gentiles, he went out to the outcasts, to the one who was marginalized in society, and he stayed with her. Why would God go, why would God send his prophet to the marginalized? Because it's his heart. It's his heart to go to those who are marginalized and those who are hurting. And then he goes, and then he, not only her, but then he brings up the, the next person, Elijah goes to Naaman, who was a Syrian, who was a, a, a God, who was a captain in the army of the Syrians, and he goes to him, and he brings healing to him. Why? Once again, he was an outcast. He was marginalized. And Jesus reminds us that his heart is for those who are marginalized. Those who are hurting. He has called us to be advocates. Listen, my friend, he has called you and I to live as advocates. Jeremiah 22 verse 3 says, this is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of his oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the alien the outcast, the one who is not part of your society, the fatherless or the, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. Can I tell you something today? The measure of our success is not going to be in the size of our church, but in our ability to be prophetic and be proactive in our community. I want to state that again because I feel like this is the word that God gave to me for today. The measure of our success is not going to be in our size, but in our ability to be prophetic and to be proactive in our community. Are we speaking life into our community? Are we demonstrating Christ in our service to our community? I ran across this quote this week, and I, I man, this really... I was going to post this, but I decided not to because some people might misinterpret it. It said this. It says, God did not call us to plant a church. He called us to plant the gospel. I read that. I was like, wow. God did not call us to plant. He said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But what did he call us to do? He called us to preach the gospel. He called us to plant the gospel. It's not about us building a church. It's about us preaching the gospel, being a prophetic and proactive voice in our community with every eye closed and every head bowed. I believe that God has called each one of us to be a prophetic voice in our community. I believe that God has called you to be a prophetic voice to your neighbor. Do you know your neighbor? And do you know your neighbor two doors down? Do you know your neighbor three doors down? Do you know the person who is constantly writing things on your posts or your Facebook posts that seem to irritate you? And have you reached out to them and say, hey, let's break bread? Have you, have you proactively reached out to someone that you, that you feel that you know by, by, by the things that they say and the, and, and the things that they're going through that they are in need of somebody to just speak life into their circumstance? Have you reached out to them? Have you sat down with them? Have you prayed with them? Have you interceded with them? 
Have you even made a mental note to reach out to them? Will you take an opportunity this week to write a little note to them and say, hey, I know that you're hurting, but know that I'm praying. The challenge is before us. That this week we would be prophetic and proactive. Father, I ask that right now, as many of us are thinking about people in our spheres of influence, as many of us are thinking about those people that we know are hurting, that we would be challenged this week to step up, to reach out to those who are hurting, those who are oppressed, those who are in need, and that we would, in a very tangible way, meet a need. And in a very prophetic way, speak truth in love into their circumstance. We ask this in Jesus' name.